Okay, YouTube is online. No, not even on, on, on other browsers. It's maybe because I'm streaming to two platforms at once. YouTube is online, Twitch is not. <laughs> Alright. Okay, it says it's online. Let me just check my channel. Oh, no, no, it is. No, it is. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, cool. Great. So they're both online now. Awesome. Okay. So let's explore the grease pencil now. Um, and just get a, have a rundown of the tools and then try to do some photo bashing. I think I will make a new scene. And I will set it up to be in 1080p. And okay, so let's start from a layout, yeah? So let's make a new grease pencil layout called 2D animation. So this comes with Blender and before it is whatever build you have, you have new workspaces built around the grease pencil. Let me just load it up. There it is. So you have a full canvas, which is kind of like full screen. You have a 2D animation canvas. You have the main, well, I added main, and then there's a rendering canvas. I made mine left-handed instead of right-handed for different reasons. And that's about it, really. So where do we begin? Well, with a canvas, you start by adding in an object and adding in a grease pencil. So I have one here already created called Notes. And let's see if I can find it. Where is it? It's kind of invisible. It's white. So in notes, um, to go into drawing, you have to go into draw mode. I will be using a graphics tablet to get pen pressure. So it's just a Wacom bamboo. So let's go to the draw mode. And it adds up this panel here. And now I can draw. Well, soon we'll be able to draw. But I can't see anything. So. There are different methods of drawing. One is called a 3D cursor, origin, or on the surface. I'm going to use a 3D cursor because it's kind of nice. And then there's a drawing plane, which is the view. And I'm going to turn on in the overlays, use the grid. So this grid is um, kind of like where I'm going to draw the angle of the drawing. Because since I'm drawing a 3D space, I'm going to have to figure out uh, what I'm gonna draw. So I'm gonna add up the strength and hooray. Make sure my lines are showing. Oh, here it is. Where is my widget? Where's my grid? Let's turn that on. There we go. So I have a grid. So as you can see, notice that I have like a drawing grid which is focused on the view, and I have the world grid. So the first things first is like, okay, understanding how Grease Pencil draws, and I'm going to go back to creating a new one. So here it is. So I have a number of different drawing modes. I have workspace mode, which would be needed to work with... Um, vertex colors or material colors or texture just go material or I could use my drawing modes with the actual lighting and in this case um, or change my world or my scene lights and change the background in my overlay settings so if I'm the scene the scene will give me for example whatever color I want as a canvas so usually concept artists they use kind of a neutral gray a neutral or a dark gray this is your environment lighting for concept art so if I go back into drawing mode all right cool so now I can draw based yeah. on the angle so as you can see my angle is like rotating around a wherever I place the 3d cursor did I miss anything ah oh, no not too much Where is my cursor? Oh, it's turned off. There we go. So as you can see, I have my 3D cursor placed around by whatever hotkey you have in your system. 
um, or you can, it's usually um, right click, old right click, to place a hotkey. But as uh, as you can see, this is where like in 3D space, I can choose to decide to draw something here, and then over here I can draw another thing based on where I have the cursor uh, placed in the scene or in the world. So if I go back into object mode and I create like a grid on the ground and I create a sunlight, rotate around just the random default and then I use the cursor. Now it's going to be placed onto the grid and I can use that grabbing the grease pencil to draw like a, a thing here and another thing over here and another thing over here based on the view angle and as you can see from the side it's changing the depth of where I'm drawing. So that's one option I can use is using a uh, projection uh, based on the view which is up here again view mode with the cursor placed where I want and then I'm good. So let's go to another frame and just draw another frame like here just erase everything. So you have a number of different options for Grease Pencil, but basically we're just going to focus on concept art or concept drawing. So and the whole part of animation I'm not going to touch. But a quick way of removing everything is just delete the frame <laughs> if you want to like draw again. Okay, so where do we begin? Um, I just deleted the Grease Pencil or I selected it again, go back to draw mode. And now I don't have any stuff. Okay, just delete that. Go make a new one. Frame 21 to 2021. <laughs> okay, so you have two modes or two tabs for relevant for the grease pencil. One tab is called the stroke tab, and the other one is the material tab. What is the difference? Well, basically, the stroke tab is your layers, um, just like you would have with Photoshop. You would have a Photoshop layer for lines or another layer for your colors, another layer for your face or your eyes, or another layer for the, the scenery or your atmosphere. So your layers is basically located in your stroke tab. So in the stroke tab, you have a number of different options to show how it works. Onion skinning for animation, but we keep it closed. How your strokes are worked with different configurations, etc. Um, and it's not a lot. You can even use masks. You can have relationships, uh, different types of adjustment like thickness or tinting the colors, or even um, how it, uh, visibility options, you know, like can I draw to this layer or can I, does it have onion skinning or does it use a mask or is it locked and a number of other options here. Um, so I have my layers and then I have my materials. So in materials, it's kind of like if I go back into my drawing mode, I, I mapped it to shift two because it's nice and easy to switch to custom modes that way. So one to select, shift two to go, and that's the B for artist way. But um, you can do that in Blender or anything you want, or just um, control tab, draw. So once you're in that mode, you can choose a material. So a material is kind of cool because now I can like, okay, as you can see, I have, if I draw on this plane here with the red um, brush right here, as you can see, it's like, it's interacting with the light. Notice that it changes um, the way that it rotates. So let me just rotate my view to the cursor, please, and then I'll continue. Lock view to 3D cursor. There you go. So that I don't get lost. So as you can see, when I rotate the view, the grease pencil is being affected by the light. That's going to be handy later. So a material is like, okay, so now I want a green brush, and then I want a blue brush. I select different materials, and you can use your tool options to select the type of brush that you want. So for example, I have an airbrush. So this is where things get confusing. Okay, so you have a brush type and a material type. So unlike things like Photoshop, where you only have a brush, and then you have a brush color, with Blender, you have a brush and a brush material. 
and a brush color. So you have three things you need to think about. So you have your material for your colors and your type of brush settings. And then you have your brush type, which you can import from different blend files. And then you have your brush colors. And you have three different menus to look at it. So I'm going to use, just for showcase purposes, a normal pen. Confused, confusing, confusion. Yes, I know. The crease pencil is kind of not intuitive. Um, they have worked on it. Uh, okay. <coughs> Say that again. You just you just do an example because it just blew my mind. Because if, if if you needed the airbrush like green, how the hell would you do this? All right. Okay. So let's uh, delete this frame and start again. No available frames are creating a stroke. Okay, make a new frame. You need a frame to make a stroke. Okay, so if I want to change this color, there are two modes. One is a material mode, which is a consistent coloring system. And then you have vertex coloring mode. So vertex coloring mode is kind of like the Photoshop mode. You choose a color and you paint with the color. And that's the vertex color that you work with. All right. So I'm going to turn off scene lights and then just use turn off scene world. There we go. Keep it nice and simple. So you have up here on the top, you have material mode and vertex color mode. As you can see here in the color panel on the right, if I make a full screen, I have vertex color mode, which is the Photoshop method and material mode, which is the method you'd want to use for animation. So Photoshop mode for still paintings, material mode is for animation. Um, you can use palettes or whatever you need. So here's a palette and you can use, you can create your palettes and you can work your different colors and you work like that. And you also but have... Then, hmm? But then for instance, your, 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 your airbrush would use your uh, green material. Okay. So... This is where you, we divide the things into two, okay? So let me just uh, get out of this, delete this frame, make a new frame. Uh, let's do an example, go from the camera mode so that we're always here. So if you think of it over here, we have vertex mode, color mode, and material. So vertex, you have um, the concept of using, uh, let me just remove the overlays. You have the concept of using the color wheel, right? With the different colors and things like that. And you just pick a color and paint with that color. That's the vertex color mode. But the material is a global option where you have a choice. So for example, if I have my ink pen and I'm in material mode, up here in the top left, I can choose a green material and then I can choose this gray fill-in material. Then I can choose this red material. And... But if you you also can make a brush and like pin a color to the brush, Correct. if I'm not mistaken. I could be mistaken, but I think it's possible. That is true. That's what you would like. So the good thing about um, the difference between a vertex and material is that basically with this red, I can now change it to whatever thing I want and all of the strokes that used that one material will be uh, modified. So I can like tell it to be filled in with a solid color or not. I can tell it to be self overlapping or not. I can change it to be dots. And uh, wouldn't send the dots is like uh, I can tell it to also be uh, thicker or thinner or whatever I want based on that particular layer or stroke. So it gives me some options of like changing the colors later. Meanwhile, if I was in vertex color mode, uh, over again. I would have to draw it again or use or repaint it, tint it. I would have to tint the texture like this. And I would have to repaint my brush strokes using a different color because it's based on the vertices instead of the material. So, um, so the material thing is more like we're gonna define something like with uh, 
when we're modeling on the node-based system and we can later on just apply on any object we want. So basically we can interpret uh, uh, any stroke with material. It's like we create a little objects that we can then apply the material, right? Correct, exactly. The material is like something you can apply to individual brushes or individual strokes or objects and tire objects and things like that. Meanwhile, the vertex is a per point thing. So can you make a vertex a material? I don't know how, to be honest. <laughs> I don't know everything. <laughs> but this, I'm just giving this um, what I basically know so far. But it'd be worth digging that up. Does anybody know Curse's question? Can I add a material to the vertex mode or vice versa? Can I change the material to vertex? Ah, wait, I can. Yeah, cool. <laughs> Let me look at that. So I just used a material to paint the texture and then I'm using vertex mode. <laughs> and then it just switches it over automatically for you. So on a frame by frame basis, the, vert, um, the good thing about using materials to draw is that your colors will be consistent frame by frame. Yes, learn something new every day, you're right. The good thing with Vertex is good. it's really useful for painting stuff. It makes your brush strokes dynamic. And I guess you could think, okay, in comparison to Photoshop, the grease pencil is kind of like painting inside Adobe Illustrator, except you have Photoshop brushes. Because your brushes are, and ultimately are used in a concept very similar to how you would be using things in uh, Inkscape or like Adobe Illustrator. As you can see, everything is, I can deform things, I can push things, I can twist things around, and everything is like, it's a concept that everything is a vector. All of these are vectors. So I can make it thinner or smaller or smoother or thicker or randomize the stuff, make it super crazy. All of these brush strokes that I've painted as if I was using a Photoshop paintbrush is stored as a, as a um, vector data, which means I can scale, push around, sculpt in mode, frame by frame, or in the actual 3D space and repaint everything all over again. That's why I can paint the brush strokes whatever color I want. And this is kind of interesting because you get the best of both worlds. Photoshop, intuitive, put your hand onto a mouse, move the mouse with the color and paint stuff. But also you get that awesome powerful pa um, power that you can have with um, vector based drawing. So you could, you could rig this. It's another dimension. It's another dimension on top of the 3D dimension. So you could rig these. The grease pencil can be rigged. You can create characters with these. Uh, it just opens a lot of doors. So ultimately, Blender at its core when it comes to 2D stuff is one of the best in the industry. Though for 2D art, it is about adequate. So let's um, explore some of that for the concept art concept as you can see okay so what is the difference between line this is a line and these are dots so as you can see I can randomize these dots but the cool thing is if I rotate in 3d view these lines have thickness so that's the other cool thing is like okay 3d stuff 3d drawing that's something that both Krita and Photoshop and any other 2d painting software has a lot of difficulty in doing is this and on top of that if I want to do concept art so for example I load up one of my scenes let me let me load up a scene of mine for concept art uh, it's called it's another short film that I'm passively doing it's kind of like my side project that's never going to advance by itself um, 3d mini projects name area firma scenes let's just go into blocking let's just grab a, a ship load up a scene there we go so here's a ship that i've been uh, working on let me just compile the shaders 
Uh, these are the references that I've been working with. Uh, I've got a bunch of other ships over there. Let me just switch out of uh, perspective mode. Or into the camera, sorry. So I have these ships that I've been working on. And if I want to like conceptualize something, make it a little bit easier, I can... Um, oh, it's still compiling shaders. There we go. Okay. So for example, with this ship here, um, let me just unlock the view from the cursor. There we go. Okay, so I have the ship and I want to conceptualize it. Okay, cool. So what do I do to conceptualize this? Um, with the powerful grease pencil, I can now like, well, let's just change this purple color to something white, a white canvas, right? So I'm going to create a new grease pencil. I'm going to snap it here. So there it is. It's just sitting in the 3D space. Now I'm going to go into draw mode. And notice that instead of using the 3D cursor, I'm going to use my mode to surface based on the view. So surface, view, and I'm going to use my draw brush. Uh, just a simple black color. And let's detail, for example, how I'm going to draw the front. So um, I can draw directly onto the model to develop a concept in 3D space. So, okay, cool. I'm now conceptualizing my idea onto the actual 3D model to have a concept quickly drawn out. So that's kind of interesting. Um, so this line, this contour line is nice. Then I wanted an edge here. Then I want kind of like some ducks here and like maybe, you know, just start drawing some stuff into it. And if I really want to, I can snap my cursor here, make sure that I can see it, and turn on this part. Is it a bird? Is it a plane? I don't know. <laughs> so um, I can snap my cursor here, use my view mode, instead of 3D cursor, view, show the grid. And then I can start, for example, drawing out something here. Uh, snap the cursor to the end and like start planning my shots a little bit or using I think a shift right click there we go hey can, can you realign things back on that grid or or once this move it's like forever maybe like eyeball um, the grid is based on the view right now but you can align it for example to the front or the side so here I'm at the front, I move my cursor to move it up a little bit, or like to this point, or like to this point. But I mean, for, 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 for instance, if, if, if we were drawing on 3D space, not on surface, and you made that window, and, and you wanted to add on the same axis as the window, how would you do that? I would put it onto the cursor mode. And now the cursor uh, yeah. will snap to whatever angle I'm snapping to. Um, so cursor is usually snapping towards the view or to the face. So if mm. my face normal is correct and I snap my cursor to the 3D face, now I can draw back to that grid and use that grid to draw mm -hmm. whatever I need, like some eyelashes or something. Mm -hmm. So... Um, there's, there's the basic concept, okay, cool, so I have some tools for conceptualizing. So how can we use this for photo bashing? Have you guys heard of Ed Hubert? I'm sure you have. No? Maybe? Anyone? <laughs> Lovely. Tears of, Tears of Steel, no, Dynamo. Dynamo, right? exactly. Dynamo, Tears of Steel, um, and all of these others. So, yeah, you've heard of him. So he uses this concept called uh, photo bashing, I suppose. Um, which is where basically you take a photo and you model from the photo to create a photo projected image onto the actual mesh. So for example, with my aircraft over here, I took a photo of a, a wingspan over here of like a, a jet wing and I used it, whoops, why am I got snapping on? So I used it here to generate a wing from the photo 
and I'm using it as 3D geometry to conceptualize my jet. Same with this chunk here. Instead of like modeling everything with box modeling and subsurface division everything to get my concept right, I actually started using photos. So same with this funnel here. I, use, I projected a photo onto a mesh kind of get to try and get an idea of what I want from this particular model. Um, so so that's what we're going to try to do and we're going to try and mix that in to create an actual thumbnail. So you guys know what a thumbnail is? Yep, some of us. All right. So it's kind of like a concept art thing. Yeah. Uh, wait, can you explain it to me? Because maybe I'm confusing you with something. Yeah, so the way I understand it is that you kind of need to deliver the story, but just with the little sketches. So you can uh, draw very basic shapes, which just deliver the story. Basic Basically, shapes. like a like a for for a story, it would be like a list of a keyframes. So well, this is how I understand it. Maybe maybe it's not also not the correct way. Yeah, that makes sense. So let's make a new layout and my general layout, and then I'll load that scene, the animatic. So let's do that. Yeah. yeah? So for instance, mm -hmm. if you have like some, let's say you wanna tell a story about asteroid hitting the Earth, right? And you just draw. Uh, one shot with maybe even like a if they for the nice thumbnail they actually even use just a grayscale mm -hmm. so just to show you the concept like as the asteroid hitting the earth or something like that oh, that's good all right i like that so i guess we could do that so we could start with the first sequence with the planets and stuff so i have my mood board already set up a simplified image or a more complex image. Cool. Sketch to low res. Cool. All right, so I have a sequence of shots where the camera is practically zooming in and cutting to the audio. Cut, zooming in, zooming in, zooming in, zooming in. Cut, zooming in, zooming in, zooming in. And more cut um, just to get the first shot done. So I have four cameras, four thumbnails that I need to think about. And I want to conceptualize it in my own art style. So before I begin, I'm going to take a look at the art style a little, a little bit um, just to kind of feed my mind what I want to do and figure that out. So here in the brief, the client brief, um, in the advanced references, let's uh, take a closer look because this is an NPR project, okay? So because it's NPR, it's going to be... Uh, kind of like me doing a lot of hacks. Um, Slink asked another question earlier up. Am I using other rendering engines other than Eevee and Cycles? Yes, I use Unreal Engine 4 sometimes. But I don't use offline rendering if I I don't touch it with a stick. Just for uh, tight production timelines, it's just not a lot of fun and it requires a lot of hardware and it's expensive. And it's not fun to iterate in. So I use uh, offline, online rendering. Eevee is kind of a hybrid. And Unreal Engine when I can. All right, so... Come on, Dres, you've been called. Use your, use your Ray, man. <laughs> we I used Mental Ray once, and I used Redshift, and I have used Arnold. Um, mainly in the soft image days. So when I was using soft image, I used Arnold, Mental Ray, and Redshift. Redshift, even when alpha, was amazing. I love it. And I think it's way better than it was back then because I was using it in alpha, alpha days. I highly recommend it. That would probably be the only offline renderer I would use. Um, but, yeah. So these are my references. I have watercolor mixed in with charcoal and some oil-based coloring or either oil-based coloring i'm not sure andromeda do you know what our style this could be like this brush stroke uh. 
Sorry? I mean, yes, maybe. What is I'll it? I'll think about this. I'll think about this. Give me a second. Nope, I got nothing. Pastel <laughs> <laughs> acrylic. Pastel yeah. acrylic? No, but it, I think it, yeah. it does have a name. You mean the way it's made, not like... Yes, how did they draw this? Yeah. How was this painted? Yeah. I think there's a mix. I think there's some watercolors, some pastels. Yeah. No, that... no, yeah, but not that the style. Tell me about the style. Yeah. I think you mentioned it, but I cannot remember. I think um, here is the biggest giveaway is the specular bounce back from the image, the photo. He's used acrylic for this image. Acrylic mm -hmm. with ballpoint pen. Yeah, but you're asking about the style, not yeah. about the the materials. I'm asking about the materials. What what brushes, ah. what paint is he using? Okay. Let's see. Is it watercolor? Is it acrylic? Either way. So I had I drew a lot of inspiration. Like all of this art is done by one artist and right now I can't recall his name. Some of them are not from him, but a lot of them are. And then I had a look, for example, this Hulk was done by him. So there's one characteristic I like a lot about it is that he's used fuzzy backgrounds and then he's using line art to highlight his heroes, his hero assets. And this is another artist who uses a similar technique where he's using line art to highlight his um, acetone characters. Meanwhile, he's using uh, watercolor as in the background. Um, so I want to, this is the art style that I'm kind of shooting for. There's a lot of color and contrast. And it's something I've never done before, so it's going to be really fun to learn how to do it. It's like a pixel art, but in high resolution. Oh, yeah. Like, like yeah, you can really draw in detail to where you want the person to look, and you can really botch the detail for everything else. So I think NPR is the future when it comes to CG arts especially from the success of Spider-Verse and others, including uh, the Mitchell versus the Machines. Um, these types of art styles are trying to push the envelope into things that are NPR, mainly because traditional animation has been saturated and traditional mediums are very labor intensive. So the next step forward is, well, use traditional mediums as inspiration with computer generated um, alternatives. So I'm not going to spend days painting one frame. No, I'm going to use post-processing and the grease pencil and line art modifiers and, and a combination of both to create the style. And the grease pencil can give me some contours and some design and also help me with my concept art nice and quickly in 3D space without too much overhead. Um, basically meaning I could model in 3D, animate in 3D, and then just render and make it look pretty how I need it when I need it. So these are my core inspirations to get that general idea. So let's take a look at the thumbnail. And wait, 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 wait. Uh, and since if, if you work with this approach, you, you get materials, right? With grease pencil? No, no, like, uh, if you try to make this style of NPR, you can maybe apply this to other materials, right? On the on the go. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean... Dreams, you're blowing my mind, man. <laughs> oh, why? You're, you're speaking to me as well, because I've been really trying to nail down how you can do everything in Blender instead of having to post-process in, say, Photoshop you know, to get that painterly look. I really want to know how to get that look all within Blender renders. Well, it's uh, with keeping it all inside Blender will require a compositing pass. And mm -hmm. there are different uh, papers and things that you need to keep in mind when it comes to NPR. One is called uh, coherent stylization. Um, coherent stylization is a concept that requires... Uh, okay, so the, here's the big canyon between 3D and traditional arts. Traditional art is flat, and 3D is not flat. 
If I move the camera in 3D using filters or post-processing, grease pencil, everything inside a 3D space, the second I move the camera, I break the traditional flat NPR believability. So coherent stylization is taking the best of traditional art and breaking those rules in 3D space without losing uh, comprehension in the 3D space. So you have to find a, it's kind of like the uncanny valley of, of rendering. Um, NPR needs to work in 3D space, but at the same time, it needs to look like it's been hand painted or handcrafted or has a, a coherent style. So mm -hmm. Mitchell versus the machines or um, Spider-Verse, they used a coherent stylization by working the concepts of comic books and the concepts of watercolor painting and line art uh, by mm -hmm. pushing more towards the 3D aspect and just decorating it with the 2D aspect. With my concept, my coherent stylization is going to be heavily post-processed because uh, it's, it's a different style. So I'm mm -hmm. going to have to focus more towards the traditional flat side of things using post-processing and I decided to do it in Unreal Engine because Blender doesn't have it. But if okay. you were to do it in Blender, you would do it like this. So let me just load up the project. Thanks to Steph here, actually. He challenged me and in an hour I kind of experimented with the idea, which opened up a lot of doors. Oops. Let me load up my SSGI build. Nice. Yeah. Okay, let me just load it up. But basically the image is the following one. Called uh, medical instruments, I metal back purple and grease pencil. Here we go. So let me zoom in. So basically, just to give you an idea, is I took a 3D scene like this, and then I had a look at like the style that I want to go for, which is like kind of like that. So I started playing around with it nice and quickly, and then used a shader and then reprojected the post-processing onto 3D geometry with some procedural uh, trickery, I suppose, UV transfers to get these like water splotches and the paper texture and the deformation of the strokes and everything into the image. <laughs> I had two hours <laughs> to figure this out. But um, So can you go through the steps? So the first step was Blender second step was this is all blender mm. let's go all right so let let's me go. just um let's dig it up just to show you grease pencil extra love into the scene i have two scenes render and composite so i'll just load them all up let's go into my render scene okay so here's my render scene let me just compile the shaders this is rendered in Eevee with SSGI. Not that anybody asked, but I love this one. <laughs> it's going to take a moment for it to compile the shaders. I quickly drop in something I did and in oh, it's too large. Okay. I'll be back. Sure. Okay, cool. The shaders in there, 33, 40, 16%. What? <laughs> Alright, so just to give you a walk around the scene, there's some trees that uh, my partner in crime did. And we scattered them using particles into like a world using procedural wood material. Then I used uh, weight paint and scattering as well for the leaves onto the terrain which is quickly sculpted a rock was also quickly sculpted then using a mixture of sculpting and box modeling I made the character which was based off a reference from another TV show we threw in two volumetrics and then lit it up from the camera view 
So I render that out. Cool. And then when I render that out, I go into the composite tree. Here's my composite tree. Let it compile the shaders. So my composite is based off um, a two-step levels of compositing. I did one level of compositing from the render, and then I did a second level of compositing from an actual render onto a shader. So as you can oh. see, in the 3D space, I threw in another light, and I threw in some uh, alpha masked um, splotches of stuff on top of the image with a UV transfer placed on top. So as you can see, his nose goes onto the mesh. And then I used a PBR material of paper with the actual render from the last shot. So I rendered the plate, I did a render plate, and then I filtered the render plate and then reprojected it onto some papered stuff and then re-rendered the paper stuff. And Jesus. so in my compositing tree from the render plate, I even added some color balancing, some uh, noise, a vignette, you know, I added some pre-compositing pre into the render, onto the render plate directly. So if I render this mm -hmm. out, it will create the render plate. And then I just save the render plate to disk. And then I use the render plate in, from the shader and render to disk again using the camera and the so here's the here's the render plate a little bit of noise uh, some color balancing as well uh, the depth of field everything I needed and then I'll use that in the material uh, may I ask a question here yeah yeah so as far as I understand you kind of first you rendering the scene with this creature and all of that and then you use this render to render another scene to get the end image correct correct yeah, so, so uh, the question is so uh maybe it is possible to actually with this node editor uh, which you're currently using to actually render a scene to some particular node that you can use later to to do as an input to some other nodes. So maybe kind of bypass this saving to the hard drive, but rendering in memory kind of thing. If you um, if you get this is called using render buffers, um, and Blender does not allow anyone to access the render buffer from the shader editor. You can access them from the compositor directly, but it is going to be very slow and it will not be real time. So for example, this, as you can see in my material, I have my paper material mixed in with the emission of the overlay of using these brush uh, watercolors from the UV map pasted onto uh, an overlay of the render plate using the UV map. So this here was very fast, instantaneous, and I could see how I want to like position. So if I, for example, move around these blotches in the 3D space, um, it's going to update immediately. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this this type of concept. Yeah, but you cannot have an animation, right? So you cannot kind of move camera around and do the same thing. No, you just can't, you you have to work with one shot, right? This is yeah, this is for one shot. Why? Because this is we get to the problem of stylization coherence, is that we're looking through a filter. So, the brush strokes on the character is not attached to the character. So the brush strokes of the rock is not attached to the rock. The texture of the depth of the world is not attached to the depth of the world. Meaning, if I rotate the camera, everything breaks. And the illusion breaks. The illusion breaks, exactly. Does it look that bad? Say that again. Could it not just look stylized? That it kind of, the brush strokes constantly change and as the character say moves like the brush strokes are different every frame but that just adds to the style does it not 
Um, fortunately, it does not, based on no. the number of studies. Okay. Based on what you've seen. <laughs> okay. Um, there are a lot of good papers. Let's see if I can dig them up for you. I wonder if you could use, like, oh, I forget the name of it, but do a pass that um, picks out each individual part and then. You can. Oh, here it you is. can. What's that called? Where, um, so, for example. Everything's the same kind of color. Yeah, let, let's, let me show you what has been done with Unreal Engine to give you an idea of what would need to be done to get some coherent stylization. So if you can see my screen, uh, let me just mute it, press play. So here's the 3D world, right? You can see his 3D world. He adds in the material so that he can ultimately uh, create a coherent brush stroke using post-processing in the 3D space in real time. Um, so basically, he's using a concept of uh, share a post-processing material using accessing the render buffers to create the concept inside. So this is where, like, this is an extreme version of it, where it's applying the filter, but. Um, the render buffers inside Unreal Engine has its own node editor and it works in real time. They have plans to develop this for EV and I think cycles in the future. Coming soon, 3.02, I think. <laughs> I don't know. But it's coming to Blender in the future where they will allow us to access the render buffers in real time and use them like real time compositing. And in this case, in the future, we could both compile uh, real-time post-processing with using the depth butter buffers and etc. to create these effects. But for now, it can only be done inside Unreal Engine and Unity and other things that have access to the render buffers. But the bad thing about Unreal Engine is it doesn't have the grease pencil. <laughs> that's something that's so useful. 3D strokes. So you had raise that. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Hmm. I'll go on. I was going to say something that's not very important. Okay. So my this project that I'm working on, I'm going to have to mixture the two. So I'm going to use the render buffering and the 3D worlds of Unreal Engine, but render the grease pencil from Blender and just composite the cameras together again to get my style, basically. Um, that's good. I did hear about the buffer as well. I think it was in last week's. Blender today. Yeah, so it's coming out. It's coming soon in the future, in the near future. Yeah, to you. The word the word I was thinking of earlier was crypto mats. Does that help you any? A little bit, can yeah. You, but but just a crypto mat, and that alters the image. Yeah. Do not. Um, this would be in the compositing, as you say. I could do everything that I that I want to do inside Unreal Engine using the compositor directly inside Blender but I would have to render the render buffers to disk or from the actual frame before I can even edit everything. And as you know, um, the render buffering of, or the rendering in, in Unreal Engine is, ah, sorry, in Blender is slow. But here is, here's an example of coherent stylization that I'm telling you about using the render buffers. No, focus on the dots. Notice that the dots change shape the closer they are to the camera based on the strokes so that regardless of the distance your brush strokes are even across the object yeah mm -hmm. making the 3d thing as you can see i have a constant number of points and then i have a fractalized distribution so to get fractalized distribution with the coherent stylization this is where you would need to use render buffering using the depth past and a number of different other things. So a lot of people have done a lot of papers about this and this is what you would need to work through to get your coherent painterly effect. So as you can see a spinning ball and also how do things like blend over each other so there's no popping, um, different things like that and you got to work that through. So I work. I read through all of these papers. I'm working through them a lot, and I'm still. I haven't actually touched Unreal Engine yet. But the theory is that I need to make sure 
that my 3D models look like they're painted, but in 3D space, and that they don't pop and glitch, as you can see. So around the edges, they blend, and they look fine. Um, and, they, and the objects can spin around in 3D space and still look and get that kind of like painted look. And then on top of that, highlight, just like the artist does, highlight the key aspects that I want to highlight. For example, his eyes, or the actual character, or the thing he's looking at, you know? Okay, and that's why you need Grease Pencil for Exactly, that's why I need the artistic direction of Grease Pencil. What about line art? Does that help any? Oh yeah, well, for sure, because then I could use a mixture of line art and Grease Pencil to highlight my character's uh, design. Also, I could use shaders inside, black and white shaders, to get my charcoal shading dynamically. Mm -hmm. oh, um, that's so cool. This. Can you like this? Oh, yeah, yeah. So coherent stylization, that's the concept that you need for NPR. Um, but we deviated from the central question and my time has run out. Hopefully you all had a good time. <laughs> um, I will send you a whole bunch of links now, actually. They're all here. Dynamic solid textures for real-time coherent stylization. These are the links. So let me just copy them into a window. Here's one. Uh, the other link is the one that I just showed you. Here. And the other link is dynamic noise primitives for coherent stylization. Then there is um, a stylized rendering in Unreal Engine, which is a paper from a blog. Another one is a paper for like using Ghibli style NPR modeling. And there is using Unreal Engine Marketplace. There's a product that you can buy. Oops. That you can buy to and pick apart to get some kind of like how does it work. Then there is another concept of using uh, the Kuwahara filter. Um, the Kuwahara filter is basically the go to filter for painterlies. So there's a couple of videos there. Um, then there's a blog post which talks about uh, oil-based painting using the Kuahara filter. And then there is the Patreon, I think it's five bucks, and he will give you the example, the first example that I showed you before. So those yes. were my sources for this type of coherent stylization that you would need to figure out using the compositor or figure out using geometry nodes even. I, I tried an example using geometry nodes actually, and it does work. Mm. But um, so um, also Salami, uh, he made an experiment using coherent texture noise depth um, in shaders. So that's also possible. You could do it directly from the shaders to some degree. And that kind of worked as well. So there are solutions out there, but um, for me, geometry nodes is not uh, stable enough when it comes to rendering. Um, I can't use it in production yet. Mm -hmm. um, last time I tried to use it in production, I was crashing way too often. Um, but good enough. So let me just link you up these uh, links and uh, We'll wrap up today, I suppose. Oh, whoops, I sent you the image of the links. <laughs> Were you using the geom the geometry nodes in before Artist or in Blender? Both. And they crash? Oh, yeah. Never done. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The reason being is that um, it's too young. And because it's so young, it's uh, they haven't ironed out all the main key productions. They haven't finished rendering their short film that uses geometry nodes. Let me put it that way. Their test project uh, is not even finished um, yet. So yeah, because they're using it for that on the sprite pride. Uh, exactly. Movie. So I would say, okay, but, I can use it for rendering when they finish rendering. Oh. Um, 
yeah? All right, so that's it for today, I suppose. Right, here's my links to coherent stylization, things you need to think about. Um, let me just read the comments. Do images appear above the nodes by default? No, this is an add-on called node previews. It's worth it though. Um, another question is, I've seen that in other videos but never figured out how to make it happen. That would be so useful. The point cloud thing is something I was experimenting with in Geonos. This is a really interesting application of it though. I tend to agree. Angel says Lino is one of your favorites to look at. Kate agrees. Slick left his latest render which is looking good. Oh, that's all, I suppose. All right, so, yeah, Thomas, thanks for hanging out. I hope you had fun. Thanks, Angel. Uh, and, yeah, I'll be here next week, next Thursday. Uh, same time, same place. I'll be mm -hmm. continuing to explore concept art, and hopefully I'll have a better example. But today, our conclusion was, yes, using mood boards in the video sequencer editor is useful, especially with the latest transform tools. And also, um, we had a big discussion about NPR coherent stylization and the different techniques of how to do it in theory. And also a quick introduction to how to use uh, colors and materials in the grease pencil. Yeah. Uh, well, we can go back into that next Thursday. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Cheers, man. That was cool. No worries. Um, I left. I left an image like I was trying. To, I've been doing little bits, and I feel like Blender really is like a bit of a crutch for someone that can't draw. So, um, that's how I'd been sort of delving into NPR a wee bit and using, using yeah, using Blender to make the shapes like physically realistic, and then doing the post processing in Photoshop afterwards, and actually can. Probably see a bit of image trace there as well from Illustrator. Yeah. But that's why I'm like, I'm, I've just had it in my head. This is kind of coming out with like a retro press kind of mm -hmm. filler in, in Photoshop. It's got that look. So, yeah, that there's always been that niggle in my head. It must be a way to, to do this in post processing. So, um, I don't think it's quite solved yet, but I think, yeah, this stuff could be close to it and definitely a good starter. Oh yeah, and it's definitely possible. I mean, just recently, uh, Sujeji, Paul Sujeji, uh, or Sugigi, Paul Sugigi, he has an add-on for line art in Blender as a shader. So, uh, Paul Sugigi. Oh, the Ghibli clown. Uh, Paul Sugigi line art add-on for materials. He just released an update. Um, uh, where is it? Oh, I'll have to look at my email in one second. It was released this morning. CS Lite update for 2.93. Paul Kajiji. View attachments. Gumroad. Here it is. Um, there are two methods. You could do it before you render, and you could do it after you render. Uh, Paul, Paul Kijiji's um, method is doing it uh, before the render, and then you use the line art and everything else before you render, and that's perfectly fine. So he has that printer kind of style inside the materials uh -huh. to give you that okay. kind of look. So he has a free version, and he has a paid version. Paid version obviously is way more powerful, and it's reasonably mm -hmm. priced, but um, it's something I need to explore. And this will probably help you get that print look without needing to go too deeply into the concept. Mm -hmm. But once again, like, how do you evaluate if this is good for you and for animation? Well, uh, coherent stylization. Keep that in mind, mm -hmm. and then you're good to go. Meta. Yeah. Este, like, how geometry knows crash? Like, what, what not to do? 
you know what is that the question why not to do so it doesn't crash <laughs> does, that, does that make sense try to apply your geometry nodes when you can apply them make your instances real and deactivate your trees so that your tree is not evaluated at render time and then all your geometry is practically baked unless you're doing things with animation <coughs> yeah so try to bake and apply your trees okay. when it's done and then you're good to go okay. it's just unstable and unpredictable I can't say it's like hugely unpredictable but like uh, I the one time I used a geometry nose to render it was crashing on me <laughs> mainly because I had 300,000 instances but even then all right so there you go thanks so much Trace you're a great teacher man cool. you're a very kind cool all right I'll keep it up I'll do it next Thursday Okay, guys, well, I'll talk to you later, yeah? I'm going to have some lunch, and I'll be back to work. <laughs> See ya. Here. Bye. Bye.